events about what's happening in the conjuncture with the most recent event was on the protest in uh, Colombia. But what has been happening in Cuba is extremely important for us to talk about, to learn about, to discuss about. I don't yeah, think that it's the in the many people still the in- The recent event was on the protest in uh, Colombia. Oh, sorry. Um, what I wanted to, there was echo, so I have to stop talking. <laughs> um, our most recent event was on this protest in Colombia, and today's event is very important because we cannot be quiet about what is happening in Cuba with the violation of human rights, the attacks to artists, and the racialization of artists. So we have here a very interesting panel with first-class scholars. Uh, we have two historians and a sociologist. The first speaker will be Alejandro de la Fuente. He's Robert Good Bliss Professor of Latin American History and Economics at Harvard University. His work focuses on race, slavery, law, art, and Atlantic history. I will mention only a few of his books, Becoming Free, Becoming Black, Race, Freedom, and Law in Cuba, Virginia, and Louisiana. Habana and the Atlantic in the 16th century, and the groundbreaking book, A Nation for All, Race, Inequality, and Politics in Cuba in the 20th century. Tanya Sanders is an associate professor at the Center for Latin American Studies, is a sociologist of culture with a research focus on Cuba in Brazil. She's the author of a very important book on hip hop and race in Cuba entitled Cuban underground hip hop, and she's working on black queer activism in Brazil. Lilian Guerra is a professor of history here at the University of Florida. She's the author of several books. I will only mention a few. The Myth of Jose Marti, the book Visions of Power in Cuba, Revolution, Redemption, and Resistance, Heroes, Martins, and Political Messiahs in Revolutionary Cuba. And she just finished a fifth book. And so thank you to all of you for participating. So let's start with you, Alejandro, and thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you very much, Carlos, for the, for the kind introduction and uh, to you and to the colleagues at the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida for organizing this event. That center has been something of a second home to me for many years now, and I keep coming back one way or the other, um, usually in person, preferably in person. Um, and I, I'm grateful for, um, I'm grateful to the center for hosting this conversation on recent events in Cuba, and particularly for calling us to reflect on how the Movimiento San Isidro intersects with historical patterns of racialization, stratification, and mobilization in Cuban society. As we speak here today, and I feel obligated to say this, uh, Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara continues to be detained uh, against his will at a hospital in Havana. And we know very little about his fate or about his condition. Um, this, is, uh, this is simply an outrage. It's not acceptable, it is abusive, uh, cannot be condoned, cannot be explained away, should not be tolerated. Uh, it is also, by the way, enormously counterproductive uh, in the current uh, US-Cuba moment. Other young members uh, of the group, including Denis Solis and Michael Osorbo, are, are also detained. Uh, I wish we could be here today to talk about something else. I wish we could be here today to talk about struggles against racism and exclusion uh, in the context of the visions for equality and emancipation that were once at the center of the Cuban revolution. I wish that we could have the sort of plural, respectful, constructive, inclusive dialogue that the artists and intellectuals of the Movimiento San Isidro and the uh, 27 November movements have been calling for. So to Cuban cultural authorities, one simple question, por qué no? Why not? What is happening? How 
how do we understand these uh, recent expressions of mobilization and protest by artists, activists, um, and other popular actors, uh, many of them of African descent, grouped in this San Isidro movement, movement born in one of the poorest neighborhoods uh, in Havana. Any historian knows the barrio, knows the neighborhood because the Archivo Nacional, the Cuban National Archives uh, is, is located uh, there. So we all have walked through these streets and through this neighborhood. How do we transit uh, from the narratives of emancipation that claimed uh, that the Cuban revolution was for los humildes, for the humble ones, to the arbitrary detentions, the police harassment, the intimidation, the abuses against precisely the humblest citizens of the nation. How do we go from one thing to the other? We should know that the movement's manifesto issued in 2018 does not include demands for racial justice, does not speak directly about race. It is rather framed in the language of human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of artistic creation, in opposition to Decree 349, the infamous Decree 349 that many of you surely know, and that many, if not most artists and intellectuals inside and outside the island perceive as a crude attempt to criminalize forms of artistic creation that take place some, somehow outside official channels. Uh, we should also note that the manifesto calls for dialogue, for understanding, for acceptance. They ask to be accepted as legitimate interlocutors and actors in the process of creating a better Cuba. No estamos convocando ni a la anarquía ni a la confrontación. Deseamos el diálogo y el entendimiento. We are not calling uh, for anarchy or confrontation. We want dialogue and understanding. Llamamos a nuestra par contraparte institucional a que nos escucha y nos comprenda, que acepte un diálogo que solo podría traer paz y estabilidad a la nación en las horas del futuro. We call on our institutional counterparts to listen to us, to understand us, to accept a dialogue that can only bring peace and stability to the nation in the future. These are their demands. Why then do we center race in our analysis today? Is it because several of the uh, members of the movement are people of African descent? Is it because some of the signatories of the manifesto, such as rap musician Su Andre del Rio, of the legendary duo Hermanos de Causa, still my favorite rap group uh, in Cuba, Tania may disagree with me, uh, have been, people like him have been active in anti-racist efforts in Cuba for decades? Is it because of the movement's closeness to hip hop? and to the popular culture of a neighborhood that is largely inhabited by persons of African descent? You know, as I was thinking about this, I suppose that the answer is all of the above, but then more. But these protests and these demands are coming from one of Havana's poorest neighborhoods, one that is largely uh, inhabited by people who are racialized as black or mulatto in, in, in Cuban society, it certainly has something to do with it. Now this neighborhood is very close to some of the best known tourist attractions in old Havana, yet it is largely excluded from the opportunities associated with the tourist oriented economy and from the new economic activities that mostly, although not exclusively from the private sector have sort of blossomed uh, in, uh, in the shadows of that, of that tourist economy in Cuba during the last uh, few decades. Um, people such as the residents of San Isidro are among the losers in Cuba's new dollar-based service tourist economy. An economy that on top of everything has collapsed during the last year, due primarily to the pandemic, of course, but also to the inability of the government to introduce broader economic reforms. Cuban economists have been calling for this for decades now. And I should also say to the economic sanctions uh, of the US government, which intensified during the presidency of Donald Trump. So Cuban society has experienced uh, a process uh, 
processes of intense racial stratification during the last uh, few decades. This is a well-known process by now, and I do not want to spend too much time on this. On the one hand, uh, the dollarization of the Cuban economy since the 1990s resulted in fast-growing racial inequality as remittances flew and continued to flow disproportionately to white Cubans. In a recent paper that I, I wrote with sociologist uh, Stan Bailey from UC Irvine, using data produced by a study of Katrin Hansing and Bert Hoffman, we estimate that the ratio of remittance reception is about 76% among whites and 29% among non-whites. This is access to dollars that families send. As people say in Cuba, what you need is faith, familia and el extranjero, right? You need family abroad in order to get these uh, resources. Now, remittances used to uh, finance consumption, creating what the Black Civil Rights Organization, Cofradia de la Negritud, described in the late 1990s as massive differences in purchasing power and living standards in the Cuban population according to skin color. However, in the last decade, remittances have also begun to finance investments, thereby becoming engines for further social stratification. People such as those living in San Isidro are very unlikely to be part of this process. To the extent that they are part is by exclusion. They have no access to these resources. The fact that they live in a poor neighborhood, again, anybody who has walked through these uh, streets knows what I'm talking about, means that they don't have access to two of the most important assets that anybody needs in order to launch something in the private sector, housing, housing stock, a good house, in order to, you know, to rent rooms or in order to, uh, to open a paladar, one of these family-based restaurants, or the capital needed to fix the house in case you have it. Uh, they simply don't have access to those resources. For Cuban act activists have been speaking about this, by the way, relentlessly for years, and they have been calling attention to the fact that um, programs that are not racially defined are having devastating consequences for the Afro-Cuban population in the island. Adding considerably to the disadvantage of Afro-Cubans is the fact that the growing private sector it's a social space characterized by openly racist and discriminatory practices. This is a racially segmented sector, and it is the only growing sector of the Cuban economy. So if you put two things, both things together, you get a sense of what's happening. Activists again have repeatedly denounced the circulation of employment advertisements that specify racial and gender gender preferences, in addition sometimes to age, height, and all kinds of variables for positions in tourist uh, facilities uh, uh, and in private enterprises. People like those living in San Isidro, folks, in other words, simply have very little chance to get a decent job in the only dynamic sectors of the Cuban economy, particularly in a private sector that is in the process of naturalizing openly and unabashedly exclusionary practices along racial lines. I have actually collected quite a few of these advertisements over the last few years, and I could find references for you in case, in case you are interested. But brace yourselves. The language used in some, used in some of these advertisements is openly offensive. Now, these people, people like those living in San Isidro, they experience racism and, and exclusion as something structural, something that affects their lives, their life chances, their opportunities to advance uh, in fairly devastating ways. As anywhere else, the pandemic has exacerbated these differences even further, making them painfully visible. It is surely not a coincidence that one of the demands of the Movimiento San Isidro targets dollar stores which are perhaps the most visible illustration of how some Cubans, mostly white Cubans, have access to resources and goods that others, mostly black Cubans, cannot consume. The people of San Isidro do not go to the dollar stores. That's not, their, <laughs> that's not the place they go to every day. 
now that these act activists have turned to cultural practices, to cultural expressions, and to cultural platforms to make sense of their situation, to make claims, to formulate demands, is not particularly surprising. Uh, culture is frequently the space uh, used by subaltern actors to counter disenfranchisement. The 1990s witnessed the emergence of voices, initiatives, projects, cultural producers, and organizations that eventually consolidated into what is today a fairly potent and fairly diverse Afro-descendant movement, a movement for Black civil rights and for equality, an anti-racist anti uh, movement. The participants in this Black civil society um, were initially forced to develop a new language to address uh, to address a problem that was not supposed to even exist. Uh, we just didn't even know how to talk about this, how to uh, talk about these issues, because racism was supposed to be a non-issue, uh, a solved problem uh, in Cuban society. There was no need to talk about that. And cult cultural actors, musicians, visual artists, writers, filmmakers uh, led these efforts, which later, later resulted in organizations that spoke of civil rights and racial equality in their programs and documents, organizations such as Cofradía de la Negritud, which I mentioned before, or the Comité de Integración Racial, or many others. Musicians and activists linked to the hip hop movement played perhaps, if not the leading role, certainly a leading role uh, in this effort. And it is surely not a coincidence that some of the activists in the San Isidro movement, such as Denis Solis or Michael Castillo or Sorbo or Eliezer Marquez, El Funky, identify with the hip hop culture and use their poetry and their music to articulate demands to that's how they express, that's how their voices are heard primarily. I'm sure my colleague, Professor Tanya Saunders uh, will have something to say about this, given her work, her excellent work on, uh, on Cuban hip hop. Nor is it surprising that someone like Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara uses art and artivism to intervene in public debates about justice, freedom and inclusion and other, Another signatory of the, another person who signed the manifesto is Tania Bruguera, who is very well known for her efforts to use uh, art for civic literacy to promote uh, new understandings of citizenship from her art project, what she has graphically called arte útil or useful art. But Otero Alcantara, I think, also connects with his art, with a group of mostly Afro-descendant visual artists who since the 90s have also used their artistic production to talk about questions of racial exclusion, marginality, police violence, uh, and racist stereotypes um, in Cuban society. Uh, the work of the artists of San Isidro in the San Isidro movement can therefore easily be analyzed, I think, uh, as something that originated in the fulcrum created by all these artists since the 1990s, you know, from hip hop and from the visual arts. Um, in the visual arts, many of them grouped uh, around the curatorial project Keloides, in which I myself have intervened at some point. There are, by the way, other temporal arcs, other possible temporal arcs here, because those artists in turn were building on previous traditions that perhaps we need to acknowledge here uh, as well. And I don't know if uh, my dear colleague, Professor Lili Guerra, who has worked uh, a ton on this, will we'll talk about that. Last, but certainly not least, I think there is another reason to center race in our analysis. And that reason has to do with how uh, police violence has been unleashed against these activists, to, to the way their neighborhood has been approached to the nature and the quality of such violence. Uh, not that repression doesn't target activists and artists who are not of descendant, it does. But it is difficult, or I at least find it very difficult. I would like to share this, this impression with my colleagues and see what they think about this. I find it very difficult not to associate the utter disrespect shown to these activists, to their homes, to their art, to their artworks, even to their bodies, even to the, just their physical integrity. With white, I find it very hard to separate that from uh, widespread notions of black 
inferiority. Uh, the fact that some high ranking cultural officials have referred to some of these activists as marginal, marginales, speaks to these racialized perceptions. Because marginal is an epithet that is frequently applied almost exclusively to people of African descent uh, in Cuba. Uh, it is a proxy in a sense for blackness and for all the negative attributes that are socially associated with it. So I think my time is basically up. I'm gonna finish with perhaps uh, a most basic uh, observation. Uh, I'm a historian and I am a historian, um, I'm a historian of, um, of race, of inequality. And I have over the years learned as much as I can about how much we owe to Africans and their descendants uh, when we want to think about justice, democracy, inclusion uh, in the Americas. Historically, Africans and people of African descent in Cuba and across the Americas have always been at the forefront of struggles for democracy, equality, and inclusion. So the San Isidro movement in some ways is just another chapter in this long-term uh, history. It is impossible to even begin to write the history of freedom in the Americas uh, without them, because freedom after all has historically been constituted by reference to black enslavement. Uh, so if we're gonna talk freedom, we've got to look, we've got to look to places like San Isidro. It is something of an irony, however, that just a few blocks away from the modest house that um, hosts the movement is the house of none other than Jose Marti. This is almost painful to say for me. You know, one of the architects of the Cuban nation, someone who worked hand in hand with Afro-Cuban activists and intellectuals to envision the sort of homeland that people like Otero Alcantara could claim their own. So I'm going to stop there and give the floor to uh, my colleague, Tanya Sanders. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. Um, and I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you, Carlos, for um, organizing this. And thank you for that wonderful context. First, I'd like to start my comments by just talking a bit about my entry into this question. And it's in two points. First is through my research, as Alejandro mentioned, um, focused on arts-based social movements in Cuba, particularly Black arts-based social movements with a focus on the Cuban underground hip-hop movement during the 1990s and the early 2000s. The second is my positionality as a U.S. African-American. Um, there's one element of this larger international debate in which there's this explicit question um, and even tension on the part of Otero and some, some other actors in the San Isidro movement where there's this question of where's the Black Lives Matter movement um, and then larger questions about Black lives in general across the diaspora. And I'll return to that towards the end of you know, some of my comments. So what's going on? Um, well, I, I would like to say that we're centering race in this discussion, but we're also centering race and class um, and implicitly gender and sexuality as well, as the experience of Black people, regardless of their gender, sexuality, class positionality, all of our experiences are shaped by the intersections of all of these different axes of power within society. One of the things that's really clear at the moment is that Cuba is in a definitive moment in its history. It is in the middle of a transition, some might argue, into being a Caribbean nation once again. And what I'm referring to here is a Caribbean nation in terms of this economic structure, um, its internal dynamics, and the relationship of the state to the larger population. This traumatic shift uh, started in the 1990s with the fall of the Soviet Union and the, 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 the beginning of the special period, the liberalization of the economy that Alejandro um, talked about and its effect on larger Cuban society, with Black Cubans in particular feeling it the most intensely and um, in many ways, the first, um, some of the first to really feel this transition that something was happening. It's clear that at some point soon, uh, the embargo is gonna end, 
the state has no more argument in terms of justifying its policies, its actions. Um, Latin America has changed. Um, there's no longer a Soviet Union. So in this context, one could easily argue that the state is probably pretty scared about its own viability. Um, and part of that might underlie the reasons why the state has become totally unhinged um, in, in recent weeks, in the last year. Um, it's always had its repressive tendencies, but when you see the Minister of Culture slap um, a Cuban artist uh, who's protesting and trying to initiate a conversation, um, you get the impression that the Cuban state is now officially saying, gloves off, we don't care, we're gonna go in. So in thinking about the question of race, um, well, one of the things that we should remember as Alejandro pointed out is that the black social movements in Cuba are diverse. Um, just like the black social movements here in the United States. One of the things that I will point to in thinking about the race and class connection is thinking about, um, as, as Alejandro mentioned, the question of, is this, uh, is, this the, is the San Isidro movement a specifically black social movement? Um, it addresses the issue of race in terms of a larger question about social equality but is it a specifically black social movement? And the reason why I say that is because I think that this movement is pointing to something. Um, it's pointing to a larger dynamic within in Cuban society that has its roots, not only in other black social movements that really took off during the 1990s, such as um, hip hop, reggae, timba, and experimental music. All of these music cultures offer the language that a lot of the artists are using today. And again, remembering that a lot of the artists from these other social movements um, are also a part of the San Isidro movement and other um, critical arts movements that are getting more in a national visibility in the current moment. But the one thing that these moments did, and this is remembering, these are the folks involved in the hip hop movement and reggae and theme by experimental music. They are not, your classically trained, most of them are not your classically trained artists. They don't have the same level of cultural capital nor the economic background um, and the type of international connections, if remembering cultural capital, that many of the artists who have the visibility from in, in the San Isidro movement um, have. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about this question of race, et cetera, is remembering how much um, poor Black folks who organized to talk about questions of everything from transgender identity to Black feminism, to Black economic empowerment, to police brutality against Black youth, the ability of Black youth to be able to attend universities uh, in, in Cuba as the, the country could no longer offer the type of financial supports that it once did. Um, all of these folks are having these debates and kick off these debates in the 1990s. They don't necessarily get the same level of visibility um, as some of the movements here, but they're all in conversation with each other. That doesn't take away from the central point, and that is the San Isidro movement is pointing to something and is pointing to a larger dynamic civil society that has existed in Cuba for decades now. So in mentioning, um, just going through my notes, how these moments did give important foundation to language concerning race, gender, sexuality, class, I mean, economy. Um, I think it is important to think about what the manifesto, um, the in, in, in manifesto talked about or what it didn't talk about. And it's in this way in which I say it's not an explicitly black social movement. There are explicitly black social movements that exist in Cuba, and there are a series of grassroots initiatives that continue in neighborhoods where people are supporting local community members, um, empowering black youth, um, empowering black trans women. I mean, there's a diverse of movement, diversity of movements that is happening. One of the things that um, in this debate about Black Lives Matter, um, where are Black Lives Matter? I think that's important. 
is um, the sort of complicated relationship that a certain sex type of politics has, or how about, I think it would be better to start this way. Cuba's complicated. There are a lot of move, moving pieces. And when we start in, engaging the international dimension of thinking about race, um, support, et cetera, things get even more complicated and there are a lot more music, uh, moving pieces. For example, um, I've been receiving these emails also from some Cuban artists and activists asking where are black people, don't we support our black brothers and sisters in the African diaspora? And my response to that question would be, um, we've been in Cuba and we still are, and we're still supporting a lot of these movements that don't get a lot of visibility. But the thing is, is that when we think about, uh, God, I just totally lost my train of thought. When we think about the, because again, there's so many pieces and I just wanna make sure I check off each one. Um, when we think about artists like Otero, for example, who stated his support for President Trump and, and also articulated in some lives that he wasn't necessarily in support of Black Lives Matters. Uh, that represents a misreading uh, of a lot of the political dynamics happening within the United States in terms of the diversity of, of Black social movements in this country. And also the fact that Black Lives Matter is totally decentralized. Um, that's something that I could talk a little bit more about in the question and answer session. But again, in returning to this question of race and the way in which there's an element of this movement that is claiming to represent the interest of Black Cubans, um, my question is, is it? Um, is it? And in some ways, um, it's not. It's focused on a very specific set of questions about civil society. So the way that you have this convergence within uh, Black social movements and these types of elite artistic um, activist movements, um, are the convergence are in areas like thinking about, um, so let's just talk about Black social movements, investment in affirmative action, economic equality, um, challenging police brutality, respect for African-based religious traditions and African-based cultures and the foundational role that Blacks and, Af and Africans have played in Cuba. Um, and again, remembering that Cuba's racial structure does not mirror the Black, white racial structure of the United States. And so there are questions about the classification, the mulatto classification, and what does that mean in terms of how those of us outside of Cuba read um, the types of pro-Black or um, types of activism that actually challenges the question of race, um, particularly when we think of how the people of color category um, looks uh, is, is a bit different in Cuba. But I remember going back into some of the things that Black folks are concerned about, questions about um, police brutality, queer, trans, Black women's rights, feminist rights or women's rights in genera, general, as well as freedom of speech, right? The freedom of organization, the freedom just to be able to um, make sure that the country um, lives up to its promises, either with the current um, government um, or a, in terms of it reforming itself or something else. And I'll stop my thoughts there. Thank you, Tanya. Dr. Gerber. Unmuting. Okay. <clears throat> well, I want to just clarify that um, that Luis Manuel Otero, to my knowledge, has never supported Trump. I think that might have been Denny. No, it's not. He said it in a in a live. I can find it for you and send it to you. Well, that that'd be good. It, it's a good segue to the presentation that I have because let me see if I can let's do this let's to share screen. Um, okay, so I want to minimize my, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm apparently rusty on, <laughs> on, on my Zoom um, skills. Okay, let me get rid of this. So I want to basically present 
much of what Tanya and um, Alejandro have presented from a different angle, which is to really question why these artists are such a threat and why blackness in relationship to the threat they represent has to be part of this discussion. Um, and so I'm going to begin with the, the question is why are black artists like Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara or those who made Patria y Vida, these, these composers, one of which is um, now in prison, um, such a threat to the Cuban state. And really, I think the answer lies in the fact that they violate political taboos. They violate not only the law, which I'll get to in a second, but they also violate political taboos that may be perhaps even more important than the law. Um, one of which is represented simply in the notion of pluralism. You know, having an opinion other than that of the Communist Party or a position other than that of the Communist Party for the last 62 years has technically made you a non-revolutionary and therefore not a member of Cuban society. Um, so I think that that really does matter. Pluralism has never been part of the equation of what it meant to be a revolutionary or what the revolution was about, according to Fidel Castro. And this was specifically very true after 1961 with the adoption of communism. So. That said, I wanna kind of walk us through some of the political taboos that are being violated and why in fact the, their violation speaks to a, a generalized um, outrage that Cubans have felt particularly after 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the government's sudden adoption of foreign investors whom they had spent decades demonizing as their collaborators in the creation of a state-run capitalist economy that excludes pretty much 80% of the population. Um, most Cubans still rely on state government jobs, they rely on rations, and there haven't been a package of political reforms that have allowed them to develop in full and unrestrained ways the civil society that rappers and artists have struggled and others have struggled to promote and to represent and to embody. So I would say that one of the things that really became a prominent feature of reality um, in Cuba that was undeniable with regard to the treatment of blacks and the, the way in which they were excluded by nature of their being from this economy and from the reality that shaped Cuba for the last 30 years is police constant harassment of blacks. I mean, in mid 1990s to the present, you could not walk across Havana um, any time of day and not see cops stopping a black man for no reason. Um, the fact that they were themselves in many cases, um, men, these policemen, security forces themselves of African descent only speaks to the deeply colonial relationship between beliefs in black criminality and the treatment by the communist government of blacks. And that is not just true of the 90s, it's true much more deeply when you look back at the 1960s, for instance, or the 1970s. In 1962, the Cuban government, or through the voice of Fidel Castro, claimed that racism had ceased to exist in Cuba and that the nationalization of the economy, the adoption of socialism, had automatically desegregated Cuba and that racism um, ceased to exist and the, the revolution had triumphed over racism. And this created then a context in which those Black Cubans who were communists in many cases, um, they were intellectuals, they were artists, they were filmmakers, they were historians, they were average folks, they were theater, um, uh, theater uh, theatrical um, folks. That may, created a tremendous problem for them because they wanted, in fact, to expand beyond the economic nature of, of what is racism to attack the fundamentals that go into this perception and belief that is still very present in, Cuba, present in Cuba today, that criminality should be ascribed to Black culture and Black ancestry. And so, you know, there, there is a hidden history of government censoring Black critics and suppressing their efforts to document racism after 59. This is a quintessential example of that. Sara Gomez has censored 1967 film on camps for pre-delinquent youth. To give you a sense for the kind of coding, the codes that in fact were created, especially in the mid 1960s through the early 70s, that enabled the state to reproduce racism in new form under communist rule and under socialism. One has to recognize these the terms that were built into this, into the legal codes of Cuba that then enabled this. So one of them is this idea of pre delinquence, you know, and the fact that Sara Gomez herself, a black woman, a black filmmaker, and a communist, um, 
discovered that the majority of kids subject to this kind of a term and then sent to labor camps, sent for re-education so they could become true revolutionaries were black, um, meant that, that she violated a taboo. Others did so as well. I mean, Nicolás Itogui and Landrián, Waltero Carbonell being two of the most prominent um, who were not just you know, censored, but silenced. And they were silenced through labor camps themselves on multiple occasions, and in both cases, electroshocked out of their brilliance and inability, and then and their ability to speak coherently to make the work that they had become known for as revolutionaries, and both of them as members of the Communist Party. So all that happens in the late 60s and early 70s. What also happens is the creation of this concept of social dangerousness. It was something that had pre-existed the 1959 revolution in Cuba's legal codes, but it expands dramatically as the Cuban state begins to try to clamp down and really eliminate what are heterogeneous ways of being Cuban, heterogeneous political ways, but also cultural ways that would impede indoctrination within the communist ethos. And that's especially true of schools whose purpose after 1973 was officially to create a communist personality in every child. So as part of that, those folks who were santeros or you know, participants, practitioners, believers in what is regla de ocha, an African derived religion, um, they were subject um, to automatic detention, to fines, et cetera, under the 1972 to 1974 revisions of, of the, the legal code, the Código de Defensa Social, the Code of Social Defense. They were labeled as socially dangerous. Um, they were labeled oscurantistas, promoters of the dark arts um, by, by the Communist Party, and they were persecuted. Um, in my own research, um, when I have interviewed the Archbishop of Olguin, he has told me that in the 1970s as a Catholic um, in an atheist um, um, society that was atheist until 1991, officially atheist, he did not consider that Catholics were the most persecuted of all um, religious. It was in fact practitioners of Santeria and, and their blackness in their great majority made them subject to and, um, and therefore a threat um, uh, uh, subject to this kind of cultural criminality or the legacies of a pre-communist society that then made them um, a threat. Now, let me see if I can get back to the, the next slide. So what kind of protest is, 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 uh, is illegal in Cuba? And I think that's important just to remind us of this. Well, street protests of any kind, not organized by a government entity. Opposition politics of any kind, and especially after 2019, you have a kind of resurgence of a security state because that constitution, very specifically in ways that the pre-existing 1975 constitution did not do, this constitution makes supporting the socialist system as defined by the Communist Party obligatory of every citizen. That um, it also it states very clearly that the Communist Party's monopoly on rule is irrevocable. So that makes makes for a different kind of a context legally and what I think the state is feeling that it can get away with or its officials who are carrying out the repression and feel that they can get away with is the direct result of, of the creation of this constitution and the legal instrument that they believe it provides. And then, of course, lastly, public art is not that you know, is not in support of the state is not allowed and and this is where the work of Luis Otero Alcantara, um, it violates many taboos and, and it also violates the law. So performance artists, I think more so than other artists, and, and this, when I mean that, by that I mean people who make paintings or sculpture. Performance artists make temporal art, something that you see and that disappears in the moment. So it lends itself to protest. And in the 80s, this arrived in a big way on the Cuban art scene. But with regard to Luis, uh, Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara, you have this first piece that's really caught the attention of the cops um, in 2017 because it spoke well beyond race to the majority poor that Cuba um, really you know, has as its population. Um, in this piece, he stood before a Kapinski, Kapinski group um, created restored hotel and mall. Um, may, this is the Kapinski group for those of us who um, have never entered um, one of their properties is they tend to, to make the most expensive hotels in the world. They are more than five star kinds of hotels. They are, and this mall is a place where neither you nor I really could afford to buy even perfume. So let alone 80% of the population in Cuba. So there had been prior to its restoration, a bust of Julio Antonio Meya, 
the founder of the Cuban Communist Party in the 1920s prominently displayed. And suddenly the Cuban state just, you know, took it away um, and it disappeared. So his piece was to dress up um, as if he were himself a sculpture or, or rather a bronze um, statue. He put this thing headgear on his head um, and he simply asked, where is Maya? Which of course in so many ways speaks volumes about the hypocrisy of the state and their desire to erase at the same time that they uphold the nature of communism, to erase what it's supposed to do, the egalitarian society it's supposed to create, and of course, the fact that the majority of the wealth in the society is being controlled, not just by foreign investors, but by, of all things, the Ministry of the Armed Forces, which are their partners, and the giant conglomerate that created this building and that controls tourism and other um, major sectors of the economy that are capitalist. So, in December 2017, Otero Alcantara was again detained when he followed up um, on this first performance or this other performance by joining about 5,000 to 7,000 other Cubans, if not more, um, in the annual pilgrimage to the shrine of San Lázaro. San Lázaro is Babaluaye. He is um, not um, as Afro-Cubans and others um, who participate in the pilgrimage conceived as the Catholic saint, and yet they walk to a leper's colony, a former leper's colony and a shrine to the Catholic saint of St. Lázaro. Usually some of them will drag themselves, they have petitions for the saint, and lo and behold, um, the petition that Luis Manuel um, circulated online to San Lázaro and distributed really spoke to far beyond the <laughs> far beyond his own needs. Um, oh, San Lázaro, you are stronger than all presidents and the power of this world. I ask that you help the Cuban people. I ask you, miraculous state saint, to eliminate the misery of Cubans, that neither death nor violence be the path to transition. I ask for genuine democracy in which legality may protect us. And for this, he was detained um, for three days and eventually released. And then he completed his, um, his pilgrimage um, in the absence of others because it was over by them. So these just two examples give you a sense of what the kind of, what, what's the kind of stuff that this guy does and why performance art, whether it be in the form of just what I've, this kind of temporal art or, or rap music, you know, why it is so violating of so many political taboos at once and why it represents and constitutes a, a shaking of the foundations of the power structure in Cuba. So I wanna add here, why does the reality of Cuba before it changes somehow prevent us from recognizing um, this kind of stuff as mainstream news? I mean, so far I have yet to see um, major coverage of, of, the, of the repression that's happening of these black artists and other artists, and then also protesters. We now have five protesters and five independent journalists um, who have been detained since April 30th um, and early May. So why isn't it not making the news? I and mean, one thing is that, you know, we if we really want to believe in pluralism, we have to believe in political pluralism, ideological pluralism, even if it doesn't serve our interests. And often, if that means um, that it's uncomfortable for us to criticize the Cuban state, um, because we as progressives at one point thought it was a badge of honor and it made us into even more progressive simply by going to Cuba, criticizing the United States um, by defying its, um, its, its embargo, by defying US isolationist policies, by defying aggression. Despite the fact that that might have made us more progressive in the eyes of fellow progressives, it does nothing for those on the island who, you know, have to live in the reality created by a the kind of state whose political values no American progressive could could stand up and 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 um, and endorse. I mean, whether that be the lack of the right to political to politically protest, or the right to protest, or the right to strike. Or, I mean, all the rights that we have here that we take for granted and see as essential to what it means to be a progressive. None of those things do Cubans have. So this, I think, is very important. I also think that there is a sort of tourism that is very imperial, and that sees Cuba and Cubans as a, you know, a source of our own entertainment. We wanna see Cuba before it changes because their poverty is different than the poverty we see elsewhere in Latin America because their poverty is not necessarily linked to um, the kind of violence and drug trafficking that makes it impossible for us to observe it. If we go to place like you know, Medellin or we go to the barrios of Brazil or we go to the poor areas of Mexico City or other, I mean, pick your place, right? So we don't have Walmart in Cuba. And, and that makes it a kind of unique and appealing, exotic form of poverty 
And yet it is poverty nonetheless. And Cubans deserve more than just, you know, third rate rations and, and the kind of unstable at best um, access they have to healthcare, as well as the quality of that healthcare, as well as the quality of the schools. I mean, nobody, you know, anybody has to be in Cuba, anybody who, ha who is in Cuba for more than a week cannot escape this reality. It is everywhere. So let me end with the, the, the notion that this particular video that came out was one that was collectively created, the music, Patria y Vida, but it, it was the ultimate violation of a taboo that has stood the, the test of time. And that taboo is one that says that you cannot defy this idea of patria o muerte, fatherland or death, because to do so makes you a non-revolutionary, excludes you from the revolutionary Cuba that has existed since 1959 and that supposedly continues to exist. So the, the title itself indicted the whole concept by throwing it out and saying, no, fatherland and life. The fact that two out of the three artists in this image from the video are now in jail, um, or at least one is detained in state security and the other one is being subject to who knows what kind of brain damage through electrocution or what have you, medical treatment in a hospital in which he does not want to be. I mean, this is, a, this is abhorrent. Um, um, this is abhorrent. And I think that we have to recognize that complexity is part of Cuba, but there's also some simplicity. And basic human rights, is at the heart of what we need to recognize as essential to understanding what's happening in Cuba and essential to understanding that Cubans deserve more than what they currently have and what the communist government wants them to have. So on that, I will end. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Lillian. So why don't we open the floor for each of you to have comments on the other presentations? So do you want to go first, Dr. Saunders, and if you have any comment about what De La Fuente or Guerra had to say? No, I think that um, one of the pieces, and then I ran out of time a little bit, that I wanted to mention is the in terms of thinking about the sort of transnational dimension, because there are all these op-eds that are being published in the Miami Herald, these emails are going out, that um, there's an interesting um, way in which politics in Cuba, as it pertains to challenging the government and what it means to assert, for example, support for Trump or, or those types of things, um, has to do with the internal politics of cha challenging uh, a repressive state. And then also um, the way in which that can get misread and misinterpreted um, outside of Cuba, <clears throat> but also how actors working within that scene can also misread read and misinterpret um, a lot of dynamics as it pertains to Black Lives Matter um, in terms of their um, decolonial um, anti-capitalist critique of racism and social inequality. So that was the larger point that I wanted to make with the comment about um, the Trump supporters. It's not to get into a debate about who supports Trump and doesn't, because that's, that's not what's relevant. What's relevant is what are people saying when they make certain types of declaration and what type of political standings um, are they actually, political stand are they actually taking? And we have to remember to look deeper. Um, I think as we're beyond time now um, to think of Cuba as a complicated country um, with its own internal and dynamics and, and contradictions to fall into the trap of continuing to have the type of simplistic analysis that um, existed during the, the Cold War and, and the two decades after. So just pointing to like the need to make sure we understand what people are really saying when they are saying certain things, because on the surface, it might seem like it's one thing, but when you scratch the surface, they're actually saying something else that's much more com um, complicated. Um, so just that. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. Dr. De La Fuente, do you want to? You know, the um, one, and um, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to talk about almost anything dealing with Cuba without, without framing it within the US-Cuba 
Um, and I think one of the one of the challenges is to actually provincialize that frame and to because you know, it's not that people in Cuba wake up every morning uh, thinking about U.S. Cuba relations or about they they actually have uh, more urgent things to do. Last week we hosted here at Harvard um, Tania Bruguera. And she was asked, of course, by a member of the audience, she was asked about, you know, about, um, you know, what's her take on the embargo on the, on the Biden administration. And she offered a very interesting answer. She said, look, uh, I have my, my personal opinion, but as a member of the 27 November movement, there is a diversity of views within that movement. And we have agreed on one thing. We want to highlight what's happening within Cuba. And we want to call attention to local dynamics, local dynamics of power, local dynamics of exclusion, local dynamics of racialization of people, uh, of people being constructed as racially in ways that are, makes it possible for the state to act in certain ways, disconnect with Lily's point about peligrosidad social. They are desperate to call our attention to what's happening on the ground. And I think I, I am very sympathetic to that call. It's not that US-Cuba relations are not important. It's not that maybe we should have another session to talk about you know, those policies and all that, but that's a different conversation. I think, I think we owe it to these activists to, uh, to uh, examine what they're going through and to examine their demands, to pay attention to their, uh, to their actions uh, on their own merits and, and, and from within, from within uh, what's happening in Cuban society. Thank you, Alejandro. Dr. Guerra? You know, I would just say, I mean, I should have left the screen up um, for at least 10 seconds longer because the, the image that the second to last image um, of my presentation was, you know, taken on the 27th of November 2020 and it, you know, shows 300 artists gathered before the Ministry of Culture. Really anyone who is a historian of Cuba or a longtime observer of Cuba has to be shocked by that image because we have not had a large scale demonstration that has not been organized by the Cuban government or authorized by the Cuban, Cuban government ever, you know, and except for the spontaneous protests that we had in 1994, uh, known as in Malaconazo. But this was, you know, this was utterly different. And the fact that it was rejected by the Cuban state so brutally um, and hurtfully, I mean, I think that also is significant. It's significant because I do believe that what, what Professor Saunders said early on in her comments merits attention. And that is that you have, you had in the 1990s because of the legalization of self-employment and until the passage of this decree in 2018, which is what the artists initially were protesting, Decree 349, you had the right as an artist to sell your work independently of the state without authorization by the state to exhibit your work without that. And then this decree reversed course. So my point being, you know, you had for this 30 year period, the increasing intensification of a civil society that was making its way out of the legal constraints and out of the political culture that condemned those autonomous efforts at political discussion or any kind of um, autonomy from the state at a cultural level that condemned those as somehow anathema to what it meant to be a revolutionary. And so what we see is this, I think it's, it's been happening for a while, but you, you see this kind of peak now in the efforts upon the part of the state to, to shut it down you know, to shut down the sources of autonomous cultural activity, autonomous intellectual activity, because both of them will inevitably imply autonomous political thought, if not activity. And the fact that these folks have taken um, an unarmed, you know, to be specific <laughs> position, you know, that's what makes it so powerful, that they're using music, you know, that they're using art, they're using thought, these kinds of weapons, um, in order to expand their presence. I think that that's extraordinary. On the one hand, instead of seeing it as, as, as evidence of a Cuba that is not being controlled from without, but in fact is growing from within, 
the Cuban government and its officials have condemned this as annexationist, as imperial garbage, as, you know, I mean, you name it, you know, at, at every level t- attempted to discredit these people individually or the whole movement itself. And some of these artists are some of the most important artists in the world, you know? Um, so I, I wanted to just point that out, I think. Thank you, Dr. Guerra. I have a few questions from the audience. So let me start with the question from Diego Palacio Ocles. He's a PhD student at Flaxo, Ecuador. And his question is the following. How do artists manage to maintain a critical point of view in Cuba? What are the dangers or consequences they face? And finally, how is race threatening to the revolution? Do you want to start, uh, Alejandro? And finally, again? And finally, how is race threatening to the revolution? Why is race a threat, a threat, a threat to the revolution? So, okay, so these are big questions. Um, these are not small questions. Um, um, in terms of uh, in terms of the art, uh, I would simply say that um, that art uh, becomes a space to articulate demands in the absence of uh, formal political uh, channels. People turn to art um, in order to uh, speak about things, in, uh, envision futures, and formulate demands that are difficult to formulate uh, in in other in other spaces. It's it, it is it has always been a very tense dance uh, between artistic creation on the one hand, censorship and what's allowed, what's not allowed. One of the uh, one of the, you know, one of the ways in which censorship works most effectively is by being fairly flexible and undefined. You never know exactly where the line is. By the time you find out, it's because you've crossed the line, and then you face certain consequences. Uh, and we could be talking here for a very long time about about this. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll connect that with race and, and then give the floor to my colleagues. But, you know, I've done work on, on visual arts groups that, are, that have somehow dealt with questions of, um, you know, have articulated different um, demands concerning racial justice, racial inclusion. Not only the Keloides group, but before that in the 1970s, what became group Guantillano, this was a group that was mostly an Afrocentric group in its, uh, in its view of the nation. And, you know, they existed, they were able to exhibit, and then they simply, they simply disappeared. They were simply written out of the annals of Cuban art. So there are different ways, and yet that doesn't mean that they did not manage to, in fact, uh, do a lot of work between 1978 and 1983 while they existed as a group. So, and that's the complexity um, that I think uh, Lily was calling our attention to. Um, it's not easy to fit these things in line- into linear narratives of just repression and just uh, redemption. There is always this constant conflict, and what we need to what we need to pay attention to is uh, is to how the conflict plays out. Um, the question is not how race threatens, why is race a threat to the Cuban revolution? The question is why would race uh, even, why do we even, why is that question even possible? That's the, that's what we need to think uh, about. This is a country that is, you know, a, a portion of which, uh, I'm not gonna go into the numbers uh, war, but th- this is a country that is largely an Afro-descendant nation, okay? So um, how can that be a threat to a nation? Uh, people of African descent built that nation. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Um, yeah. So I would say in terms of the question about the critical artists, I would say that um, there are a lot of us that think about the situation of critical artists in Cuba this way. And that is the revolution is eating its children, right? All of these critical artists, um, it's, 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 it's an interesting contradiction because it's, you know, Navarro, there are many folks who have talked about this, and that is the revolution, the, the Cuban state 
works to create these critical actors through the way that it has done things like decentralizing culture in the arts, even though it, at the same time it's trying to control it, it's, it's still relatively decentralized. And so you get these, these revolutionary actors that are, are born and raised under the system and they come out and they're critical and they're doing exactly what their civic duty is, right? To, to further, um, to work for the improvement of their nation through their critique. And the government is just kind of like, shut up. Um, and the thing is, is that for me, artists and intellectuals are the same thing. They're not, there's no difference between an artist and an intellectual for me. You can have an intellectual and an academic, you can have an artist and an entertainer. Um, but artists and intellectuals are the same thing for me because they are engaged in knowledge practices. Um, the difference between the two is the medium, right? Um, but what they're interested in, in terms of highlighting the present, explaining the present, envisioning the future, thinking about possibilities, they're all engaged in the same type of work, which is a profoundly ideological work, um, implicitly and in many cases explicitly. So in that sense, um, if you think about race, I don't think race is the problem. I think blackness is a threat to the state. And the reason why I say blackness is, this, is a threat to the state is that I'm talking about blackness as a political project. Um, blackness is an explicit, assuming a black identity and engaging in black politics and using knowledge practices um, to uh, analyze your social context that come from um, black intellectuals, artists, intellectuals, same thing. Uh, that is implicitly going to be anti-capitalist, anti-eurocentric, and is therefore anti this sort of established um, sort of system and social structures that we've inherited from a colonial period that are primarily eurocentric. So when you start getting into discussions about blacks, you can talk about race all day, right? But when you start getting into discussions about blackness as an epistemological, intellectual, ideological activist project, then you're opening the door to something else, right? And you're opening the door to multiple challenges. Thank you, Tanya. Lillian? I mean, I, I would love to um, just add that I clearly, you know, if, if Alejandro ended his comment with the question, how could it be a threat? And, you know, Tanya has just responded. <laughs> exactly. You know, of course it's, you know, it's a black consciousness is a threat. And it has always been a threat when it assumes equality with whites and it assumes equality at the level of leadership with whites. You know, the blacks are supposed to have a place in the Cuban revolution of 1959 to the present, just as they had a place, you know, in the revolutionary idea that emerged after 1898 of what Cuba was in the first efforts to create a republic. And what was that place? It was to be a junior partner, to be grateful, for inclusion. There, the, fact, the, the depth of commitment on the part of many Cubans to the idea that Blacks are naturally inferior or that they are culturally inferior or that they are intellectually inferior, inferior would be stunning to many people. And I have witnessed it repeatedly for the last 27 years, especially in the presence of African-American students who have encountered it repeatedly, you know, not just because they've been arrested or stopped by cops, but in their, you know, in their own social environments in Cuba, you know, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's stunning. And that's in large part due to the fact that you can't talk about these things. It's not part of, you know, the pedagogy of schools, you know, in fact, it doesn't exist there. And, and so racism, you know, is supposed to have been conquered by the revolutionary state with its policies. But in fact, it was driven mostly underground for a long time. And every time, you know, it, it, it is attacked and subverted, particularly by those who are black and claim blackness as a source, not just of their own national identity and consciousness, but of that of Cuba, because that's even further, right? That's a greater threat. When you say Cuba is a black nation, they Cuba without black consciousness, without slave consciousness, there would never have been an independent struggle as radical as it was. It would, when you say those kinds of things, you get into deep trouble. And, and in fact, what I've just argued is, is what about Terio Carbonet, the man that I mentioned earlier, he wrote in 1961 and that plagued him for the rest of his life. 
you know. Um, but there were many others who have done similar things, and 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 not just in the the post revolutionary period, but before. I think the big issue is that that it's not allowed to be part of this context um, at all, and 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 that it that you know I think that 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 really makes it um, a very very powerful position to take, regardless of its intentionality. Black consciousness and the claim to black identity, what it implies particularly black nationalism i am part of this country i am not separate from it and i am a leader that 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 last calculus is 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 too much for for this for this state and for many people in, in cuban society i have a related question comment from pablo herrera beitia from kissing scotland now and his question is the following if we are to consider cuban domestic politics should we not then reevaluate framing these artists as black based on Cuban colorism standards? That's the first question. And the, and the second question is, and on the fact that they have not explicitly claimed race as part of their politics. Do you want me to repeat the questions or were they clear? Should we, if we're going to consider Cuban domestic politics, should we not then reevaluate framing these artists as black based on Cuban colorism? And second, and on the fact that not they, they are not explicitly claiming race as part of their politics. Should we go the same order? Or do you want to start Tanya? Let's start with Tanya. That's exactly what I was getting at when I um, made the comments about Blackness um, in and of itself, right? Blackness in terms of lived experience um, and then also Blackness as an identity politic. Um, and so, yeah, I completely agree. And I also tried to hint at that in saying, remembering that Cuba has, their racial structure is not the same Black, White racial structure as the United States. And so when we're looking, or even Brazil, right? And so if we're looking at Cuba, um, right, we have to ask, is this a black movement? And, um, and that's exactly why um, we need to think about the complexity of this because we could very easily end up in a situation where we misread what's happening. We actually don't grasp the complexity of the conversation. And then we actually end up rendering invisible again um, the Black population who, once again, are foundational um, to these moves for justice and social equality and, um, and rethinking uh, 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 the future of Cuba, especially in this important um, historical moment. Um, I, don't, I hope that kind of answered part of your question. But yes, we need to analyze this in terms of Cuban standards to understand exactly what's happening well in Cuba. Lillian? Well, you know, I think I think for one thing, it it is important. We we have to keep reminding ourselves um, that if you have a situation politically and so, and socially where black being black is bad, and it's something that is not been challenged directly by the state um, for decades, because challenging it would then empower those who want to go beyond simply challenging those ideas, and they want to embody the leadership in the challenge. When you have that kind of a context, then you you have to recognize that, of course, you know you're going to have um, people of African ancestry in Cuba who will not want to be black, and will claim that they are not black, um, and that they are mulatto, uh, or that they are not even that. You know, this is not something that one can judge as simply, um, you know, the absence of consciousness um, or a lack of pride. It is evidence of how limited the options have been for 60 years or more, because it was also the case in the 50s, uh, <laughs> that Batista, who was himself the darkest man who ever um, ruled Cuba, you know, ensured, you know, he, he, he certainly denied his own, um, his own color, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been a very long time that Cubans have not been able to engage in ways that we again take for granted. Um, what is racism? How is it expressed and how am I, you know, an instrument of the of, of continuing and not challenging or even reproducing in greater form this belief in black inferiority and, you know, Cuba is a place that when it became a nation and it had 30 years of struggle against Spain, um, first for both abolition and independence. Then the Spanish, to a great degree, co-opted 
abolition. And what you get by the end is not a revolutionary state that comes to power with the black men and the white men side by side who were responsible for that victory. You had a white US military occupation that just distorted what path it might've taken. But one cannot forget that Cuba was for 350 years, a place where black men were and black women were expendable, not to mention black children. You know, So there is, there is a deep, deep history there that has been denied in this context as well, because one is not one does not study slavery in Cuba by seeing it beyond, you know, the labor system as an ideological system, at least under, you know, for decades under Marxist kind of a pedagogy that, you know, class ruled above all. So at many different levels to 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 discuss the colorism um, here is to sort of miss the point, you know, uh, of what is happening and how people can address what is happening and what has happened to them um, in Cuba and what terms, what language do they have at their disposal? How easily do they access, you know, this, the alternative discourses um, beyond those that are um, perhaps available in, in art and in art and in music. Thank you, Lili. Alejandro. So I think, I think, uh, thank you, Pablo, for the question. And it's, it's good to hear from you. Um, uh, I think the, um, I think Pablo is is um, is calling our attention to the fact that if the movement it doesn't articulate explicitly racial demands, why are we still talking about this? And and this question of colorism uh, has something to do with it in the sense that you know when 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 Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara goes out to his house in the Barrio San Isidro, what the police sees is un hombre negro, is mm -hmm. a, a black man. And that has a number of implications. And even if Luis Manuel is not articulating in, you know, in his, his um, the, the performance on Maya is not primarily or explicitly about race, but of course, what's happening to Maya uh, with developments like Kempinski has a lot to do with race and has a lot to do with the exclusion of Afro-Cubans from spaces um, such as such as the Kempinski Hotel and Mall that that Lily uh, talked uh, about. Um, now it's not that there has been no challenges for this. I mean, there is a long history. This is a long history of a long struggle um, to 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 produce a different national project. Uh, you know, activists of African descent and sometimes activists not just of African descent have, have fought relentlessly to produce uh, to, so, so that the question, uh, the question of the threat becomes irrelevant. You know, people like Walterio Carbonell and Sara Gomez and Nicolas uh, Guillén Landrian and the artists of Group Antillano in different ways and Rogelio Martinez, I mean, there is a very long history of uh, efforts to, to in fact uh, produce or to, or to transform visions of the Cuban nation in ways that make, um, that make, um, that, that make, um, that make it fully compatible, not just fully compatible with blackness, but that are built on, are built on that history and on those, experiences and those contributions. And in a sense, what I was trying to argue in my presentation is that I see this movimiento as part of that long-term struggle. And I, I even if they're not uh, articulating uh, explicit demands along racial lines, when they speak about the MLC stores, the Moneda Libremente Convertibles, the dollar stores, they're talking about race. They're talking about exclusion. They're talking about racial stratification in Cuban society. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sanders, you would like to make a comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would want, I, I have a question. When um, Luis is stopped by the police, is he seen as a black man or is he seen as a non-white Afro descendant? I think when we have to take seriously systems of racialization within country, well, there's a diversity of systems of racialization in this hemisphere. And we have to take seriously the internal logics of how those systems of racialization function because they reflect local level power dynamics. Pablo's asking a question about power 
Pablo's asking a question about, from my understanding of it, I'm not going to speak for Pablo, but from my understanding about it, of the question, whether or not there's an explicitly pro-Black, explicitly anti-racist via Black empowerment discourse within a movement versus it being implied is a very important question in terms of thinking about the racial dynamics in Cuba and the historical politics of whitening in which the mulatto plays a central role in Cuba's ability to define itself as something other than African or other than Black. That is the centrality symbolically and through other social mechanisms that the mulatto can serve in the erasure of Black people in terms of a Black genocide slowly over time. And I talked about the identification with Blackness as a political identification because I don't know how Otero identifies personally. I don't know if he identifies as a Black man. He does. Politically, yeah. consciously, okay, whatever. But the point is, is that I don't know how that person identifies, but there are a lot of people who fall into the mulatto category who do not identify as Black and really embrace that, that classification and the certain types of symbolic power that comes with that and pursue other political agendas that could be anti-Black. All of these systems of racializations, you have to deal with Black people and non-white Afro-descendant people who have various levels and various forms of internalized racism. But the question of whether or not there's an explicitly Black political agenda is very important because there's all of these movements that still exist and really intensified in the 90s who have a specifically Black agenda. And they need to be heard and listened to as well, not implicitly understood through another movement that might not have that particular aspect of um, equality in Cuba as its primary goal. So I, I don't think we need to, I don't think we, I mean, we are, um, I, I am fully sympathetic to the to the enterprise of paying attention to the to the organizations and to the sort of black civil society that emerged in Cuba since the 90s, and um, I'm fully sympathetic to that. I think this is something somewhat different, although I see it as part of that uh, as an outgrow. As I, I that uh, it's uh, it's a hypothesis, but I, I see this as part of that uh, general move now. Whether the, the question of whether uh, the Movimiento San Isidro has uh, an explicitly, um, you know, a political project center on blackness um, is something to be debated and to be further investigated. The fact that they are, however, you know, using hip hop, the fact that they are using cultural expressions that uh, that are that have been so central to the to the articulation of, of demands for racial justice and inclusion in Cuba, um, I, I would suggest probably gives us at least one way to, to think about this. But Tanya, beyond that, um, you know, when when somebody like Luis Manuel, I think, encounters, uh, encounters the police, um, I'm not sure that at, at that very moment, the question is uh, what kind of, what, what they, I think that what they see or the, or the way, the perceptions that, that, that frame certain forms of police action and police um, uh, reaction have everything to do with blackness. And, you know, they see, a, they see a young black man who is being, who is articulating a political project. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. They see a black, a young black man who is articulating a political project. That, you know, in the next paragraph, just that is that happen. That doesn't happen in a vacuum. That happens in a in a in a context in which uh, in which I'm sure that I mean I, I cannot demonstrate this, but I mentioned the I mentioned how police violence has affected um, him and the people in that neighborhood and. There is a quality to that violence that I think is um, is deeply racialized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this is a very important empirical question. And, you know, the sociologist part of me would just be like, hmm, I wonder if there is a way, you know, to empirically address this question. 
And I think that the, the thing, the, the emphasis on a non-white Afro descendant is very important because there is the recognition of the fact of blackness there, right? So they're not gonna be treated as a white man, right? But that's why I say it's so important to like understand the logics and it's, 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 uh, appro it's nuances within that context, right? It's kind of like thinking of the difference between people of color within the United States, where we all have to face various forms of racialized violence and even police violence because we fall within to the category of non-whiteness. But it doesn't mean that we are all there for Black. Uh, can I say something? Sure. I mean, I think that it's obvious that, you know, um, not all... Um, you know, black folks in Cuba who are perceived as black perceive themselves as black, but you have systemic racism there. You have police who are trained to believe and you have decades of legal um, um, instruments that allow them to believe that if you are in some way in opposition or in some way in defiance of what the communist party says is the proper cultural and ideological conduct, um, that you are black and protest blackens you. And it doesn't matter how you perceive yourself, if you are perceived as a, a threat to the state, you are, you fit within the paradigm of what has been the ultimate threat to this Cuban state, whether you're talking about that of today or that of the early 1900s or that of the 1940s or the 1840s. And you had, uh, you have great social and political reward in the 19th century under slavery, if you were a free person of color and, and agreed to police, you know, s slaves regardless of color and those who were your, your peers in this, in this color category, that is still true. Otherwise you can't explain why, you know, the government has recruited from the blackest province in Cuba, Orientales, to be the policeman in Havana. Um, as a, a person who's perceived in Cuba as sometimes Hava, sometimes, um, you know, it depends on where I am, sometimes perceived as white, you know, sometimes I'm called mestiza, it's very bizarre, people who know my, my family in Pinar de Rios. I, I, get, I receive all kinds of invitations to be white all the time. <laughs> and I, I, I witness the degree of intense racism and fear of blackness that um, white folks in Cuba inculcate in their children. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I have been sitting in an office about to go meet with somebody who is a superior person in that, in that facility, who is darker, regardless of whether he's black or he's mulatto or he's something else. I, if I had a dollar for every time the secretary went like this and rubbed her hand to let me know that I was about to enter a room and close the door with a, per, with a man of color, you know, regardless. I would be rich, you know, I mean, I, I think that, that this is important, you know, that people who protest, people who don't protest in Cuba, in, in the white racist society that Cuba is, um, anyone who is non-white is automatically closer to the criminal category, to the criminal, the socially dangerous, to the politically problematic, to the, you know, and excluded in a way that that is, you know, it's striking. It's striking on just a social level. So, you know, to, to end the point, I think that it is, a, it is, one just only has to go on the social media pages to see how Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara has been viewed, not just by the, 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 those who, who want to support the Cuban government and their repression of him, but in fact, the Cubans in Miami who have Facebook pages and who have declared, you know, that it, since his detention and his hospitalization and who knows what has happened to him, that, you know, he kind of screwed it up. I mean, this phrase, el negro lo caga a la entrada, si no lo caga a la entrada, lo caga a la salida, that that has been on Facebook pages, that there are thousands of likes for that. That's extraordinary, you know? And, and so of course he is perceived as el negro you know, both by those who support his actions and then have feel, felt like he didn't go far enough, you know, um, and, th and, and those who are repressing him. I mean, they, they just, incredible, right-wing Trumpists are, are holding hands with the police of the Cuban state. Um, so, you know, th this is what I had to say, and, and I forgive my inarticulateness, and I don't know how to lower my hand. There we go. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you know, I feel like, you know, when I used to go to therapy, I should go back, I guess. But when I used to go to therapy, when things are getting interesting, my shrink will always say, it's time. So you'll be crying about the big trauma, that will be it. But, you know, it's 7.30, we had a fantastic conversation. There are many questions that were asked by the audience that I couldn't read. But I really want to thank you for this very enlightening and this very honest and intellectually rich conversation that we just had. And I hope that we can continue to do these type of events. And I really appreciate the time and the commitment that the panelists had for us at the University of Florida and to all of our viewers. I don't know how many of you showed up today. And we have to do it this way because last time that we had an event in Zoom, we were attack by some hackers, but you know, so we have to take certain precautions, but you know, hopefully next time we will have an event in person and we will invite you Alejandro to Gainesville. And thank you to all of you. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Alejandro. And thank you, Krista, for organizing this.